Police and policing are hot topics everywhere, in our cities and towns, in the Vermont legislature, in the US Congress, and throughout our state and country. We know that being a police officer is a challenging and sometimes dangerous job. In the recent past, we have seen police behave heroically and with integrity, and at times we have been appalled by their behavior. We know that we don't all have the same experiences or faith in the police. This week, as we go about our lives in Vermont, a court in Minneapolis is selecting a jury for the trial of the officer charged with the killing of George Floyd. We are in the midst of a national performance evaluation for our police, of an evaluation of what they are doing and how they are doing it. This League of Women Voters series is designed to be part of that conversation and help us all become better informed citizens. The first program, How the U.S. Police Got Militarized, provided an overview of how policing, of the history of policing and how we got to where we are now. The second program dealt with policing and mental health. And the third program addressed racial disparities in policing and juvenile justice. Among the many important issues raised in those sessions, two themes stand out to me. First, we need to make some changes. Virtually everyone agrees on this. Second, we have put police in an impossible position by sometimes asking them to handle issues and situations for which they are not trained and which are not a good fit for their jobs as a whole. To paraphrase a speaker from an earlier program, the criminal justice system isn't broken. It's doing what it's designed to do. Our task now is to fix that design. In a moment, I'll introduce this evening's panelists. After that, they will each spend about five minutes giving us an overview of efforts that they are involved in. I will ask follow-up questions, and then they will ask each other questions. We will then turn to your input. I encourage you to use the chat feature at any time to make comments or to ask questions. We will be saving the chat entries so the League and the library can use this info for a compilation of resources that will later be available on the library's website. So on to our three panelists. Dr. Eitan Nasreddin Longo is co-director of the Fair and Impartial Policing and Community Affairs for the Vermont State Police, racial equity advisor for the Vermont State Police, and head of Vermont's racial disparities in the criminal and juvenile justice system advisory panel. A composer and ethnomusicologist, Dr. Nasreddin Longo was a professor at the University of California, Riverside, a lecturer at the University of Illinois, Chicago, and a visiting professor at Marlborough College here in Vermont. He continues to work with private students and in composition. Jay Diaz is senior staff attorney with the ACLU of Vermont, and previously was a staff attorney with the Disability Law Project of Vermont Legal Aid representing low-income Vermonters with disabilities through direct representation and legislative advocacy. He was also the 2012-2014 Poverty Law Fellow, defending the rights of Vermont's students and youth. Jay is health law and policy faculty with the Vermont LEND program and the University of, University of Vermont College of Medicine. And he serves on the board of the Conservation Law Foundation. Robin Friedner McGuire is an issue based campaign specialist, best known for her contributions to marriage equality and high quality affordable childcare campaigns in Vermont. Robin was field director for the Vermont Freedom to Marry Task Force, and she helped launch the very successful Let's Grow Kids, serving as the first campaign director and later as chief executive for communications. She's here tonight representing Mental Health First for Burlington and its new campaign, Cahoots for Kids and Young Adults, a non-police trauma-informed response to crisis. 
So we're going to start with Dr. Eitan Nazredin Longo, and he has asked us to call him Eitan this evening. So Eitan, it is all yours. Okay, and this is good evening, everyone. And I'm I'm just looking to make sure I know what I'm doing. Five minutes, the work I'm involved in. Um, I started working with the state police. Uh, God, it's been probably ten years now. As someone who sat on the um, fair and impartial policing committee, which meets quarterly, and in 2014 that position expanded and I became the co-chair of that committee along with Major Ingrid Jonas. Um, and it really was only recently that it became a formal position. Um, and that was really somewhere between July and September. Getting hired by the state is not the easiest thing in the world. Um, but I do a lot of teaching. Um, and a lot of the teaching that I do uh, is training, anti-bias training that I do with recruits to all of the police agencies in the state um, when they're going through their initial training at the police academy in Pittsburgh. Um, I have done in-service trainings with current um, law enforcement officers not simply within the state police, but um, we occasionally get asked to do these trainings uh, with agencies such as South Burlington, um, recently Virgins, places like that around the state. And I spend a lot of time designing these and then carrying them out. It's very like being in the classroom, which is something that I've done since 1987. Um, my work in ethnomusicology was always very concerned with race, very concerned with bias. That sounds really bizarre for those of you who know the field perhaps. It may describe why it is I'm not in it at the moment. Um, and I take that experience and I apply it to work in trying to get officers to understand not simply explicit bias, but the ways in which implicit bias is formed and informs our actions in the day to day. Um, and that's what I spend a great deal of time doing. I also, when racial equity issues come up within the, within the agency, certainly even within the Department of Public Safety, um, I consult with the commissioner, with the colonel, with anyone who needs it um, to talk those things through. So I, that's pretty much the highlight of, of what I do. Okay, would you, you have a little bit of time? Would you like to expand a little more on some, uh, any specific current issues? Current issues, let's see, we've spent the last, well, most of today, yesterday, and then Tuesday and Wednesday of last week, um, really, getting more of a handle on the traffic stop and race data in the state. Well, not in the state, regarding actually the state police um, in particular, uh, looking at different ways of gathering that data, different ways of processing the data. Currently, it's released publicly once a year. We're trying to get a handle on it more frequently than that so that we can look at trends over the course of the year and not simply in June when the data is released generally. Um, that we can get a sense of whether there are problems um, at various barracks around the state before they become bigger problems. So we are currently in the process of rolling that out. We have a very rough sort of internal website on this <laughs> We're, we're giving it a go. In some ways, it's convenient that there, this is a horrible thing to say, it's convenient that there's a pandemic because there's not a lot going on and it gives us time to sort of fine tune it because if any of you, I'm sure you all know when you're dealing with computer stuff, it's it, it, fine tuning it is 90% of the task. So we're doing a lot of work on that at the moment. Okay, thank you, Eitan. Thank Jay, you. you wanna go next? Sure. Hi, everyone. Thank you for being here tonight. Um, 
As Tom said, my name is Jay Diaz. I am a senior staff attorney with the uh, ACLU of Vermont. I've been in that position for the last five years. Um, and But I've been working on policing issues in the criminal justice system, mostly the juvenile justice system, um, since uh, since I came to Vermont. When I started the, my, my work uh, for students and youth, a lot of it was based around school discipline, kids getting kicked out of school for one reason or another, usually related to their disability, um, usually involving uh, some element of racial bias. And uh, those same groups of students being uh, referred to the criminal justice system or the juvenile justice system for minor behavior um, and in school. So, you know, that's where my work started and I, I kind of helped uh, defense attorneys a, a, a number of times with cases where the students were students with uh, disabilities, they had learning disabilities, um, uh, behavioral disabilities, uh, and otherwise, and were having trouble in school. And that was really the root of the problem is that the schools were not giving them the proper services or adequate services. And so um, obviously, so school wasn't working for them. And so they stopped working for school, so to speak. Um, you know, fast forward to my time at the ACLU, what I'm working on now, I, I'm strictly involved in litigation, but, but still do a little bit of policy work here and there on issues of policing, and as well as advising our advocacy director, uh, who, who is the one at the legislature, on, you know, what would, uh, uh, what will reduce the I guess I'd say the problems we have in, with policing. I mean, my, uh, the ACLU's range, of course, is we're a multi-issue organization. We work on a lot of different things, but a primary area and uh, you know, bread and butter for the ACLU going back for all of our hundred years is um, is policing and and trying to tackle the issues that get continuously come up with policing, whether it's over policing, whether it is um, you know, uh, bias policing, you know, race, racially based or otherwise, uh, and whether, and, and the lack of accountability in policing. And that's how we really see ourselves and how I view a lot of my work as an accountability mechanism. So when the system uh, fails, which it, which it does too often, and people's rights are violated, you know, that's the opportunity we have to step in and try and correct that wrong, try and get a person some kind of meaningful compensation, um, not just in the terms of dollars, but in terms of a legal ruling that says what happened to them was wrong and that it should never happen again. And if it does, there will be additional um, you know, legal penalty. So, so that's a lot of the work I do now. You know, I've got, we've had a number of cases over the last five years um, with a number of different police departments. Uh, you know, we've sued ben Bankton Police Department, we've sued the Vermont State Police, uh, you know, in the state of Vermont, uh, related to Vermont State Police cases, um, and I could talk about those a little later. Uh, to the city of Burlington regarding its police, we've been involved in police reform efforts in St. Albans, um, and and across the state more generally. Uh, I've been involved in working on different police policing policies, from the fair and impartial policing policy, um, the model policy that's statewide, or uh, body camera policies, you name it. So uh, I'll be happy to talk about, you know, what the ACLU's opinion is on what's going on in Vermont specifically. Um, and I think, uh, and I look forward to doing that. Perfect. Okay. Thank you, Jay. And we will get back to that issue for sure. Uh, Robin. Great. Thank you, Tom. Um, and thank you for, for having me here tonight. It's it's pretty special for, for you guys to have this discussion. Um, my name's Robin Friedner McGuire, and I'm here tonight because I'm, I'm a parent of a child who um, has uh, mental health issues and uh, because she experienced what was pre-verbal trauma um, when she was in the home with her biological family um, prior to adoption. And, you know, she had a, has had a lot of difficulties and challenges. And, um, you know, we adopted all three of our children from, from uh, the state. And um, my twins who are nine and my 
older son who is 12 years old, they've all had some experience with trauma at a very young age. And for, for my daughter, it, it has really impacted her on a level that just quite honestly, I, I think as a parent, like I just, you know, my wife and I just weren't very equipped for how to support here. And we, we realized that pretty early on and we were strongly advocating for help and support for, for years. And I think it's really important for me to express that at that time, I was the campaign director of Let's Grow Kids and had many contacts with people like our social networks were very strong. You know, we had so many advantages of white people as people who have, you know, education, a middle income, you know, we, in other words, I think on paper, people would have thought you should be getting all the all of these resources for your daughter. And I was spending up to 25 hours a week just advocating for my daughter. And what it pulled back the curtain on for me is just, there are just not very many services and we have a severely broken mental health system here in the state. Um, and I, I know this is true in other states as well, but um, we keep doing the same thing over and over again. And it's not working for our kids and it wasn't working for our daughter. And I'm not gonna go into too much detail about what happened to her, but what I can say is that she was a victim of police violence at the age of six when she was in a mental health crisis. And it was devastating. It was, it's still devastating. We're, we're still trying, you know, here's a child who was traumatized as an infant and then re-traumatized um, by our police and then you know, it really changed our lives. And this happened uh, probably about two and a half, almost three years ago. And it's taken quite a while for, for me to kind of lift my head up and um, to say like, I just, I just can't handle the idea of another child going through this. Um, I think importantly in mental health, we, we don't talk enough about our young children um, and young adults. And um, I started to do a lot of research to try to think about what are some of the alternative programs out there? Why can't, why can't we be doing this differently? What a lot of people don't understand is that there's a vicious system cycle for families who have children with mental health issues, which is if you get into the mental health system, they will tell you to call the police on your children, right? That is a part of your safety plan. Mm -hmm. If you call the crisis hotline, they will tell you to call the police on your children. If you need to take them to the ER, they will tell you to call the police to get them in the back of a cruiser to take them to the ER. If you manage to get them to the ER, they will wait there on average for three and a half days and they're lucky if they get any treatment. So you, you feel like a gerbil <laughs> as a parent. Um, and I'm not talking about for like significantly high or violent behavior. The threshold's really low. Um, so you feel at a loss as a parent um, because I don't know any parent who would want to call the police on their children when, when they need help, they need care, they don't need to be criminalized um, for the kind of support that they need. So in talking to other families and doing a lot of research, um, uh, and with the support of some great organizations, Vermont Disability Rights, the ACLU, Spectrum here in Burlington, Vermont Family Network, we decided that we wanted to um, have a forum on CAHOOTS, which is a crisis assistance uh, street outreach program based in Eugene, Oregon, which is a non-police trauma-informed response. Um, and I will talk more about that later. And through that process, we decided to launch Mental Health First for Burlington because we really want to shine a spotlight on what's not working. And we're calling for more investment in both crisis and prevention work. And I really want to emphasize that crisis because people really want to just invest in prevention that we don't even know actually works. So that's, that's what we're focused on right now. And our first campaign is Cahoots for Children and Young Adults. 
Thank you, Robin, and, and thank you for sharing the experiences uh, of your children uh, and you working with the, the systems in place in Vermont. Um, I have a, I have a couple, I have some general questions that I'll ask all three of you and then um, feel free to go back to what you started on, if any things you want to expand on, because I realize any one of you could talk for a long period of time about things you're working on. So any things you'd like to expand on, please do that. The, um, but the next general question I'll ask each of you, and maybe uh, Jay, you could start for us this time, but what are there uh, issues in Vermont that are more different or challenges that we have because we are a, a rural state? We're, you know, we're pretty spread out. We have uh, only a couple of communities that, that could be really called cities. Even our cities are small cities on, on scale with most, most places. And uh, we have lots of parts of the state that are very rural and don't even have much police coverage. So, you know, so what challenges does Vermont face because of its rural nature? If any comments you'd like to make along that, Jay? I, you know, to me, it's, well, first, let me just say that like Robin, I want to thank her for sharing her story as well, because, um, and, and for the work she's been doing, you know, uh, we have collaborated for, for a few years now on and off and we together tried to get the police in in Burlington to actually like move something forward on you know uh, police uh, getting training and having special you know um, officers with the department who were trained to deal with kids in mental health crisis and it was totally ignored. So I'm really excited to see what what she's been working on. Um, to answer your question, Tom. You know, it's, it's funny the way you put it that, you know, we're so rural and some places don't have police coverage. You know, I would turn that back around and say the, the issue in Vermont is like we are over policed. <laughs> um, our rural state is, you know, and, and this doesn't apply to all rural states, but uh, there are plenty of rural states in this country. We are the safest state in the nation. You know, we have the lowest crime rate in the country, uh, lowest violent crime rate in the country. And so, but, but we are, but we have quite a few police officers actually across the state. You know, there are some parts of rural areas where there's just the population is low. So you're not gonna see a lot of officers and it's very spread out, but we actually have a high number. And I'd be interested, you know, I haven't done the, I haven't done a comparison of, you know, uh, officers per hundred residents versus uh, other states, but I'd be interested to see that information. The reason I say we're over police is because it's based on my experience and my work it seems like officers have a lot of time to work on very low level crime, <laughs> or if you can even call it that, um, and things that aren't, don't really rise to the level of needing, even needing a police officer. And so what the ACLU has been proposing for some time and really has tried to, uh, to push into this, this most recent uh, conversation around policing in Vermont and policing around the country is we need to, um, you know, divest from police, policing to some extent and reinvest in community-based services and supports. You know, we need community-based services and supports for mental health. We need more community-based services for young people. We need more community-based services for uh, people who are uh, unhoused. You know, there are, uh, there's a lot, there's a good amount of need out there um, and, and, you know, because we're not filling those gaps as a state or in, in, in a lot of our communities, the police are being called on to fill, to rush in and deal with, and, and to, and to try to manage those problems, which is, which has been their historical role for a long time. And that's been a problem for a long time. Um, but I think Vermont has an opportunity to show like that we can do something differently because we are such a safe state and we may not need, I would argue, we don't need the number of police that we have currently. Thank you for turning that question around. I really appreciate that because um, what I was thinking of, th that issue came up, over-policing came up in at least one previous panel and it came up with the, uh, the topic of traffic stops, that Vermont has a very high number of traffic stops compared to other states and it's like, why? You know, that's the question. But the, uh, 
the other part that comes up with that situation is if if we want to shift more responsibilities away from police and to social workers and to other support services, one of the challenges is how do you provide those services 24 seven when we don't even have police service 24 seven in most parts of the state. So that was the you know, part of the, the framing I was thinking about. What if we, we could come back to that in a minute, but I'd like to give Aton the chance to talk about the rural nature of Vermont also. One of the challenge, a, a challenge that I'm, I guess, really involved in is I somehow gotten into the data, <laughs> which is interesting. It's not where I've always spent my life, um, but certainly being on the fair and impartial committee um that's one of the the real directives of that body um that there's a problem in the state around racial disparity and policing is not questioned what i do think is questionable is the extent of that problem and it's difficult to get a handle on it because the data can be read in a variety of ways, and they are read in a variety of ways. And that's led to an interesting bifurcation that one body that looks at the data is sort of favored by people of color. The other body is favored by law enforcement. So everything gets put into this dualistic frame and nobody can talk because um, everyone takes a side, which is a good American thing. Um, the problem is that the numbers are so small that there is some question as to, as to the statistical reliability of N when doing a lot of these analyses of what the, of the set that they're used. In other words, when we're talking about minorities, is the number big enough to look at? Um, my qualitative response to that is hell yes. Um, the statistical response is not as clear. And so the rural nature of the state makes it very difficult to know for me, and I'm working on this, I don't have a good answer yet, exactly the, how bad it is, where, that needs, where things need to be focused, where efforts need to be focused. The um, racial disparities panel just completed a study um, that it submitted to the legislature that has resulted in a bill that is currently being discussed that would try to get all of the data systems that are in use in the criminal and juvenile justice systems to talk to one another. They currently can't. So it's very difficult to get a sense, again, statistically, of racial disparity across both of those systems in total, because corrections has a system that doesn't talk to the judiciary, that doesn't talk to, uh, oh God, any, you know, the, the police, I mean, any number of things. And so the difficulty becomes how to get all of this to speak so that we can answer the questions about how bad is it? Where is it the worst? So we can start crafting policy and start crafting legislation that is targeted. And that's, I think, a long answer to the rural nature being a challenge. The numbers are such that it, it requires a fair amount of sophistication um, that is sometimes difficult. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, Eitan. So on, on the continuing along the same lines, because we'll, we'll, we'll do some more on the issue of, of, of race issues across the state and also mental health support. But Eitan, on, um, with doing training for state police and for other police throughout the state, how receptive are uh, police officers? I think it varies. I think it. I have. Ha I have to say, I have found people to be extremely responsive. Personally, um, I. I've had people come in. With their arms crossed around their chest, 
which is a great sign for, I am not going to listen. I'm not going to speak. I'm going to do nothing. And by the end of the uh, maybe three hours, they're actually unfolded and they're, they're animated. They're making eye contact. They're asking questions. I've had people get in touch with me long after the trainings and say that something that came up in there really resonated with them. I have to say, I'm finding people to be very responsive. Um, and I have to also say that it's changed over time. When I first started doing this in 2014, um, I would have to set the frame and talk about, okay, what is your expectation? There is a large black man standing in front of you at a thing that's obviously gonna be about race. How many of you think I'm going to yell at you about being white? And they all want to, you know, act like they're not expecting that. And then eventually it kind of comes out, well, yes. <laughs> and that's not what happens. That's yep. not what happens. Um, thanks to my mother, who is a social worker, I talk about behaviors and effects. What behaviors are people engaging in and what may those effects be? And at that, we get it race. And we get it racism. And right. I find people to be very swayed by that. That's encouraging. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. So, uh, Robin and then Jay, uh, if you could address a little bit the issue of Vermont's ruralness in terms of either mental health support or race issues or any other aspect of it that you want would like to. I mean, yeah, I can go ahead and jump in. I, you know, I think the preface, the caveat here is that I live in Burlington, Vermont. And so the services that we have sought as a family has been based in Burlington, Vermont, although I worked on marriage rights for same sex couples and on uh, the campaign for high quality, affordable child care across the state. So I, I, I can say that I really understand some of the issues. Um, concerning our state. And I, I'm not going to spend too much time focused on that because what I want to emphasize is that even living in a highly populated area where one might think that we have a wealth of mental health services for, uh, for, for people living in this community, we just don't. We're just not investing enough into our mental health system generally and also specifically for children and young adults, both prevention and crisis. Um, so the burden is just really is placed on, on the, the children themselves and, and the young adults and their families to try to manage these very difficult situations, which is why a program like CAHOOTS um, really provides us, you know, all of us who care about what's happening in our community and reimagining policing, CAHOOTS really offers a solution for a community that is as large as Burlington and even in more rural areas. It's a, it's a national model that's been in place for 30 years and it's been replicated across the country in other, you know, larger municipalities as well in rural parts of the of the country. So I think that, you know, on a state level and local level, we should be taking a, a pretty serious look at it um, because it has this intention that's very different than policing. It's it really is about care and arriving uh, to a, a situation understanding that it's all about this relational engagement for de-escalating the situation. Um, it's based out of Eugene, or Oregon, and, and it's the model is that it's a mental health crisis worker as well as a medic who goes out to a situation. Um, and they have over 500 hours of training um, in de-escalation, both the medic and the mental health crisis worker, and they connect folks to resources. And that can be a range of things. Um, it can be, you know, from food security to shelter um, to medical care. So it just depends on what the need is. Importantly, the CAHOOTS model in Eugene, Oregon, it serves all ages. It serves everybody in their community. Um, and it's a 24 seven service, uh, 24 hours, seven days a week service um, where, uh, you know, people are from dispatch. Dispatch 
dispatch is also trained, which I think is really important. They help assess the situation of who they need to send out. And then the, the team goes out and they, they determine if they need to bring the police in, whether it's going to be a co-response with the police or they need to pull out and the police needs to go in. And, you know, this program for a 160,000 population area, they're operating on a $2.1 million budget. The savings to their public safety is $8 million annually. The savings to their ER department is $14 million, $14.5 million annually. So, you know, just for that alone, for people who are concerned about their taxes, we really should be paying attention to that. And you know, I think most importantly for family like ours, we need care. I mean, that's what we need. I don't need for my child to be wrestled to the ground. I don't need for my child to be handcuffed. I don't need for, you know, my child to be pepper sprayed or assaulted or tasered. And that, that truly is what's at risk. It's to the point where families just don't even access our crisis hotline anymore. They don't call the police anymore. So, People are not accessing the types of services that are that that they need um, overall. So, you know, I think that it should be looked at both for the rural and rural and um, cities here across the state. The one last thing I would say is we really need to start talking about mental health bias and policing. Um, it has been longstanding. Every report that I've ever seen about policing, mental health bias really is, um, is highlighted in, and emphasized. And here in Burlington alone, in pa the past eight years, we've had three people who, three people who were known to have mental health issues who were killed by the police. And in a short time frame, I'm talking in a minute, you know, and there are other circumstances, but there was a large commission that was uh, a large study that was done by a commission and it and it clearly named that mental health bias was an important part of this um and you know candidly I, i'm just going to say like i think training and advocating for training of police officers i think that's important but i don't think that's the solution anymore i would have thought that 10 years ago 20 years ago We've been trying to train police officers on de-escalation and to be more professional in their approach to mental health issues. We need to start looking at what's actually working like cahoots. Okay, thank you, Robin. And thank, um, thank you for your examples and for using the phrase reimagining policing. It's really a, a helpful phrase. Uh, Jay, do you wanna add any any uh, any points to the things that uh, Robin and Aton have said, or the issues of mental health or racism? I mean, you know, <laughs> there's a lot to be said on both topics, um, and I think they've kind of reached reached the the main points. Uh, you know, I would say that, you know, in terms of bias and policing, you know, you can look at you can look at it statewide, you can look at the state police, you can look at, I think, 30 different police departments and the data, you know, all points in one direction. So, and, and that is that there are significant disparities, not just in the traffic stops, but in the searches and in, um, and in other, you know, enforcement uh, activities that police do. And the inter most interesting part I found in the data is that every time they look at, you know, the searches, um, you know, the, the, there's a disparity. Uh, in particular, black drivers are searched more than white drivers, but they're off. They're um, less frequently found with contraband than white drivers who are searched. So it's you know, it's like it just goes to the point of being over policed. And you mentioned earlier, Tom, that you know the the number of stops, traffic stops in Vermont is like I think something uh, around four times the national average. Um, and so, uh, and in some, some places like Bennington, for instance, it's seven times the national average. Um, so it, it's really important for us to recognize that, that, you know, that, that a lot of these stops when they don't even result in any enforcement action, it's a total waste of time and taxpayer dollars. 
the last thing I'll say about training is, you know, training, as Robin said, is important, but it, it certainly is not, um, should not be the focus of, of how we reimagine policing. You know, we need, I always say we need three, uh, three or four separate things. One is meaningful policy and policy being law. Uh, two is training to that policy. And three is supervision and uh, internally that holds people to account for, the, for that training and policy. And then four is citizen supervision, <laughs> citizen control that ensures meaningful oversight of the entire system. Uh, and that's, you know, that really, you know, in, in some places you have, you have some of that, but it's really been a challenge to get it adopted with fidelity for a number of, a number of factors uh, that, that we can get into a little bit more. Okay, thank you, Jay. In a moment, I'm going to ask each of you if you have uh, questions for each other. I want to share one example before that. Uh, a couple of years ago, when I was working at the library, one day we had a, a man who was in the library who uh, appeared to be having a, 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 an adverse reaction to a medication or maybe a drug, but he was, he was out of control and he clearly couldn't stay where he was and we didn't have the skills to work with him. And we're, the library is a, a block from the Montpelier Police Department. We called the dispatcher, described the situation and I was so pleased that two EMTs came. They, 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 no, no officers, two EMTs came and these two men were so patient and they, they, they were talking gently with the man. They would get him to move 10 feet and then he'd stop and he'd, he'd kind of freak out and then they'd get him to move 10 feet again. And it took them quite a while, but they got him to the ambulance and they, they took him to the hospital to get some support. But I was really impressed that it was not considered a police issue. Um, and that was great. And one of the reasons that struck me so much is because a week before I had been in a, a different community where a, a woman who uh, perhaps was drunk, but she was, she was in a public location at a store having, you know, severe trouble and, and needed help. And in that community, a police car came and all they did was the two officers, one got on each side of her and they hauled her and put her in the back. They didn't even talk with her. And they just put her in the back of the, of the cruiser and they left. And I thought that, you know, that was such an extremely inappropriate response. And the Montpelier uh, response was, was so much more appropriate. And then yeah. one step better would be actually, actually to have a social worker perhaps, but, but the EMTs did a good job in that situation. Yeah, Tom, I think, you know, your, your story and, and, you know, I've heard so many like them, um, you know, both good and good and bad is, is like the key with people, whether it's, a, I mean, people generally, when you're approached by a police officer and they're coming for you, you get nervous, agitated, scared. Um, you know, it, it's not a, it, it's impossible to have a, a like, to, that is an escalating event automatically. And so that's what, you know, at least in terms of like a mental health situation or otherwise, that's, you know, that's why we can, we can do more to prevent that. And as Robin said, preventing that in these cases means not sending police. That's the only real way to, to, to ensure that we're, we're, we're going to, you know, do everything we can to, to prevent a situation from escalating. Right. Thank you. So do you have questions that you would like to ask each other or bring up? Any one of you can jump in. If you don't, I have, I have more, but you, <laughs> <laughs> I'd like your, your perspectives. Oh man. <laughs> I'm just listening. I'm, 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 I take in information that I will use in some way to keep doing what I do. Yeah, I'll, I'll go, I have, I have a question. I have a question for Robin. Oh gosh, yeah. <laughs> uh, it's, uh, you know, it's nothing, nothing too hard. Uh, this is not, this is not a test. Um, uh, you know, uh, I'm interested to hear you talk about the reaction to your work. You know, and, and what you're, what you've been advocating for. Um, what the reaction has been from from your local police entities, or and 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 yeah, 
public officials? Yeah. Oh, thanks for that question. Um, well, I mean, first off, I think from a family perspective, because we're a family led group of people um, or people with lived experiences and also interestingly, mental health uh, professionals who are on the front line who are feeling like they need to have a stronger voice and change in terms of um, how we respond to crisis. I mean, one thing that I've realized is that a lot of families have been working on this issue in kind of um, these siloed ways, um, or they have been just completely silenced out of fear. So it's been really, when we had the forum, I, I probably had about 30 emails the following day from families and some people who didn't attend the forum but had heard about it. So it just, you know, I've been able to connect with a lot of families, which has been really nice. Um, and also I would say that people seem to have responded really positively to the idea that there's a solution um, that we can start talking about. And I have had regular meetings with the Howard Center, which is our designated agency here. Um, and, you know, they do some, some really amazing work. They have a street outreach program in Burlington. Um, and they also throughout uh, around Burlington and the other cities, they have what's called a, a community outreach program. Um, it's very limited. Both of those programs are extremely limited. And I, I think our efforts have helped really push internally a discussion within the Howard Center, as well as um, with the specialized um, agency, NFI, a real questioning of what, what do they need to be doing differently? And um, from their own policies around calling police on residential um, patients um, to why are we advising people in their safety plans to call their police? So I, I feel like there's some uh, progress that's being made there. I think the, the, the stickiness for us is that we currently have a mayor who has long allied with the police and has, I, for whatever reason, I mean, he was very aware of our situation with our family and other families who I know also went to him about their situations. And I, I don't, I'm not quite sure where he is right now. Like, I'm very interested to meet with him, but my hope is that he can recognize that this is a moment and an opportunity for for change, um, and I'm not I'm not sure kind of where he lies on this. He was invited to attend the forum. We're reaching out to him again, but I think that that's that's kind of the next phase of our work is to really try to engage the mayor's office and city council to get better educated about the issues that our families are experiencing, um, and and about cahoots and, and what's possible. Oh, good. Thank you. So I have a, a two part question for each of you. And I want to remind the participants that uh, you could be putting questions into the chat function. We uh, don't have too many questions in there yet. We have a couple though. Uh, but I, I have a two part question uh, for um, Eitan, Rob and, and Jay. Uh, the first part is what changes or actions do you see as feasible for the near future? And the second part of it is, or the second question, is how can citizens become more involved in efforts to change policing, and to improve policing, uh, and lean it more towards public safety? So what, what things in the, you know, are feasible for the near future, and how can citizens become involved? Eitan? I would, you know, I really believe and this is sort of getting back to what Jay was talking about. I really believe the oversight issue is critical. We have very little of it statewide. Um, I mean, we have the fair and impartial. I'm often asked about issues of fair and impartial policing for people in jurisdictions. They just think that somehow I'm responsible for it on a state level, and I'm not. I I work for the state police. I'm like, there are 80 agencies in the state, and you know, something comes up, what do we do? Um, well, you go to the police chief, but if you have a complaint about an officer, that feels a little strange. And if you go to the select board, that may not get you much more, given that this is such a small place. 
one of the things that I would really push is that I think people need to demand more of these fair and impartial committees that really look at the policy that has been put in place, the model policy, that's also being tweaked because it's not perfect. Um, and I think that there needs to be more local control and people need to also ask that this local control not simply be advisory, but it needs to have teeth because people of color, and that's what I work on a lot, not solely, but a lot, are tired of being asked for opinions that are not taken seriously, that are not actually processed and held to be something that's in fact in a certain sense sacred. Um, particularly if you're working as a peace officer and are therefore in the public trust. So I think that one really basic thing is to start structuring that kind of local oversight that has teeth. Okay, thank you, Eitan. Robin? Yeah, was the question, what is feasible? I, I'm sorry, yeah, Tom. Two parts. Yeah, what, what's, what's feasible? You know, something that could be accomplished in the short term. And then the second part is how can citizens become involved? Yeah, I mean, I think the thing that has struck me is uh, people have been so positive about cahoots and, you know, it's been out there for, for 30 years. And honestly, I came across it doing, you know, desk research and listening to an NPR story about it that took me down the spiral. It was a great spiral, but, you know, it took me down this path. And I think people, you know, I've gotten a lot of, um, a lot of people reached out to me and have been like, you know, how did you hear about this? How did you find this? And I think the reason why people are so responsive is people are just thirsty for change. There's a, there's a recognition that some of the, the systems that we have had for decades, they're just not working for our communities. And I, policing being one of them, mental health being the other. You know, so I, I think people are, there's sort of this moment right now that people are recognizing these things aren't working for our community and, and we need to start looking at what is working for our community. And that's, that's at a critical mass point. This isn't like a small group of, of, of people. We, we are at that tipping point, <laughs> as uh, they would say. We're at that tipping point. So I would say that there's, there's actually will of the people who want to see their leaders move forward for dramatic and drastic change that actually works um, for its community. So I, I think doing something like cahoots in Burlington is very feasible in the very near future. And I think the way that people can and do need to get involved, of course, is to talk to the, you know, at a, a very basic level, talk to their family, friends, and neighbors about these issues. And on a on a larger level is to engage with their local leaders and decision makers about the importance of this type of change and, and to not get stuck in this mindset that incrementalism is somehow healthy because what we have found is that incrementalism is not really healthy for, for those of us who are more vulnerable. It, it truly isn't. and. Um, so anyways, I, that's, that's what, how I think people can engage. Okay, thank you, Robin. And Jake? Yeah, I mean, in terms of feasible solutions, I mean, there's a lot of good work happening right now at the legislature uh, over the past two sessions and, and over the past many years. I think that there are bills out right now um, that are being discussed in the legislature that, that um, need your support. So. Um, I think there are a lot of ways to get involved, but you know, and th these are around reducing, um, you know, the uses of force and holding people, holding officers to higher standards. There are bills around data collection and analysis. There are bills around accountability. So, I mean, there's a lot there, of course, um, that I think is, is absolutely feasible. And I think, I mean, I think having meaningful policy uh, changes and, and getting better trainings and, and um, is definitely possible. I mean, you can do this at the, you can do this at, with your state representatives, you can do this in your local community. So how to get involved 
and you know, I'll be a little, I'll throw a little shameless plug in um, into the chat. Like, you know, the ACLU of Vermont has a 10 point plan to reimagine policing in Vermont. Um, we have an action page that, that's linked to here and that you can sign up for updates and, you know, and, and get in touch in ways to volunteer and, and be a part of the movement. You know, and I think, you know, there are a lot of little, uh, there are a lot of smaller groups meeting across the state. I think there are a lot of ways to get involved. What those groups should be doing is, of course, advocating with their state representatives around certain pieces of legislation. Um, but also what's really important, because it's really about culture, a lot, or I guess a lot of it, and the former head of the police academy in Vermont told me this, like, we can do all the training we can do, but culture eats everything. And so it's all about the culture of, any, of it, it can be all about the culture of any given department. So you need to talk to your police chief, talk to your town manager, talk to your select board. What, what are they doing to, to in, encourage and ensure oversight? And you know, what's the data looking like? Have they even talked about it? Um, you know, we're, let's democratize policing. Vermont has a long history of citizen involvement and oversight at the local level, you know, we have community boards on everything. Um, you know, why do so many communities not have one about their police departments? Um, you know, that is not a hard thing to get started and to, to encourage. So it's, it's, it's about changing, that's, a, that's another piece of change in culture, not just within policing, but within our own communities. Okay, thank you. We do have a, a number of uh, comments and questions in the chat box now. So one, one of the Porter asks, so is it appropriate as a cisgendered white Vermonter to step up to try to get our local police to move forward on public safety? On the one hand, I don't want to um, marginalize populations uh, to have to do all the work. On the other hand, I don't want to step in there and be the white voice all the time. Um, in 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 the process of planning this panel, one discussion that came up with some people we spoke with was the issue of how much uh, how, how much white people should be involved in racial issues. Clearly, um, white people need to be involved in racial issues, but in what ways? In what ways? Hey, Tom, do you want to jump in on that? Well, given that the state is ninety six percent white, if the white people aren't involved, we're gonna have a lot of trouble here. Um, I think, you know, when I, there are times when I've been in therapy and my therapist has talked about playing push hands and that being a model for relationships that you push a little and someone pushes back and you find a certain amount of parity. And I don't think that that's a bad metaphor here. I think I have to say, I'm. It's wonderful to hear somebody say, "I don't want the you know the marginalized populations to have to do all the work and to have the 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 compassion to be able to put that out there and also the further compassion of not wanting to step in and take over." But there is no reason why your voice should not be part of this allyship. Frankly, if that's not part of the solution right now, nothing is going to happen even nationwide. I mean, Black people have known this for years, right? We're, we're real clear on this one. Um, so you got to get in there. But the other thing would be then in terms of your personal politics, when a person who's marginalized actually steps in to be able to stand back and perhaps not begin with a declarative statement when you're dealing with them, but to perhaps begin with a question. That gesture on its own is extraordinarily powerful and very welcoming and inviting. Okay, thank you. A another question, there are a couple related to economics in here and there's one that someone gave me ahead of time too. But basically the, the issue of the, the challenge of funding in Vermont and trying to balance one program, because often what happens if money is taken out of, if you need money for one program, it's taken from something else. So what impact is economic, does economics have on the failure to fully fund community-based resources 
at the expense of funding fully police and institutions like jails and hospitals. So any of you want to jump in on the issue of issues relating to funding? Yeah, it's a, it's a, I mean, it's a really good question uh, from, from my buddy, AJ. Um, you know, I think, yes, that's an issue, uh, but, you know, here in Vermont and as in many other places, you know, our, we have a, we have this problem of a scarcity mindset. We think that there's a scarcity problem when it comes to funds, but there isn't, um, you know, we have resources in this state, you know, that can be, can certainly be shifted, um, can certainly be changed, but there are resources that can also be built. And so uh, I, I don't think that, you know, if we keep going with the scarcity mindset, we're not gonna get anywhere. We need to think about how to grow and, and you know, but if, and in terms of just dealing with the dollars that are in the current year state budget, I suppose, you know, we need to, figure out what our priorities are as a state. You know, I think it was, uh, uh, might've been Martin Luther King Jr. who said like, you know, show me your budget and I'll tell you your priorities. Um, and so, you know, that's what we need to, to, to think about and really focus on, you know, what are we, uh, what are our priorities and does our funding actually match them? Okay, a follow-up question on economics from Marissa. Uh, related to economics, do you think it's worth worth it to spend money on things like trainings and body cameras to improve police behavior, or is it better to direct that money away from the institution um, of police departments altogether? I'm going to stay out of this. Okay. And maybe, as Jay say, maybe it's not an either-or, but... But a lot of times when people are doing budgets, an awful lot of times, having worked on budgets myself over the years, a lot of times it does become an either or. Well, so, well you know, and just, just, well, just, just to make yeah. a point, like, just, just remember Vermont does not have a balance, balance a requirement that we have a balanced budget or anything like that. So, you know, we, we take out bonds for, for lots of different things, um, you know, and, but it's rarely for community-based uh, services. So it's just something we need to consider in how we how we deal with this. And it just it just stop talking about it as if the money is not there. Um, because because there's a lot of ways to get it done. On the specific question of trainings and body cameras, you know, I don't want to be talking too much, but um, but I do know a lot of, about the body camera issue in particular. You know, uh, we can talk that that could something we could talk about for an hour. Body cameras can be useful in terms of accountability, but it's real, they're really only as useful as the rules governing their use. And so what we focus on, you know, uh, in terms of body cameras is like, you need to have strict policies about how they're used and what happens with the, with the recordings and, you know, making sure people's privacy is protected, et cetera. You know, at the same, you know, while we have these things in place, some of these mechanisms, um, I would say like these are very small investments. The training on whether it's friend and partial policing or otherwise and body cameras, these are relatively small investments compared to the $500 million our state spends on policing across, you know, across the state. Um, you know, these things are a drop in the bucket. So, so that's, you know, that's not where most of the money is going. However, the question where, where most of the money goes is to the number of police we have and the number of you know, and the, and the, you know, maintenance of vehicles and all this kind of stuff. Like that's where a lot of the money goes. And that's where, um, you know, we think that you need to encourage alternatives uh, by, di you know, by divesting from some of, some of the policing structure and moving it into these other areas. Cause other, you know, because there's, if there's too many police, then, you know, uh, it, it, or I guess it, then, then you're going to get people in situations that, that they shouldn't otherwise be in in the first place. Um, and they're not getting, as Robin has said, the care and support that they actually need in a given situation. Okay, thank you. Hey, John, did you want to jump in on that again? At first, you wanted to stay away from it, but then it looked like you wanted to add something. No. Okay. I mean, I, I have something to add. Go for it. 
Yeah, I think I have something to add because I, I think this ties to what, what Jay was talking about in terms of culture. I think for decades, we've had a culture where we have felt that we need to build up our corrections, we need to build up our police departments, and it's just the wrong way. And this is an opportunity for us to pivot away from, from that and really think about what we can be doing to support people who have mental health challenges, substance abuses, and start to build up those community resources rather than continuing to invest in these systems that just aren't working and are burdensome on taxpayers. So why do we continue to invest in our corrections at the level that we are investing when we know that a lot of people are in the corrections for nonviolent crimes, for example? You know, so I think we know we can identify these opportunities, but it's the political will to make those changes. And I, I think that that's where people's engagement back to the previous question is really critical. Um, instead of you know having this question of as if it's a zero sum game because you know i agree with jay i think the money is there i think it's about you know your budget is a moral document so i think it's about how what we decide is important to us and in investing in those things okay thank you robin um uh Another comment and question from chat. Uh, this is from Richard. To follow up on panelists' comments and personal backgrounds, training is clearly important. But how important is actual personal experience to assisting police, EMT, and other organizations to better understand and more properly handle such situations as you've been addressing? From my perspective, full immersion in or language comprehension, fluency with, personal familiarity with sexual preference differences can, can so greatly facilitate individual agents' willingness to accept the lessons they're learning from training. So anybody want to comment on that? Perhaps I'm sure. shameless, but I... I <laughs> Remember when the army used to have that that slogan, be all that you can be? I yeah. kind of fall into so many categories that the police have trouble with that my training is inherently personally that I've designed around a lot of the personal experience. And they do actually sit in the room with a queer person of color who's also Jewish and neurodivergent. And that's the person who's training them also, and a power lifter. Um, and I just stand there and kind of go, here we are, guys, let's, let's do this. Let's just do this. I think you're absolutely right. The personal experience is, um, is essential. Um, I've got a leg up on that one. I'll admit that I'm a little privileged. Okay, thank you. So Carolyn, if you're reading the, uh, um, in the comments too, apparently there's some some odd visuals happening on some of the tiles. So I don't know if there's something you can uh, do anything about or if it's just particular to certain computers. Um, and also in the, in the chat box and, and the League of Women Voters is going to, the, to compile these, but uh, there are a number of resources listed in the, um, in the chat. So that's, and we won't have time to go through all of them, see. and. Some of the some of the comments include a lot of information here. So find some that are uh, showing up for racial justice. One of the organizations, uh, uh, support organization listed, and also uh, information about Robin's group, Cahoots, and and also ACLU of Vermont. Um, so various resources here. Uh, Vermont Racial Justice Alliance. So uh, a suggestion, uh, please call your state senator and ask them to support S63. And some of you I'm probably, probably know right away what that is. It's the law to remove enforcement officials, law enforcement officials as school resource officers, um, which has been in the news a lot. So I don't know if any of the three of you would like to comment on that issue? 
Yeah, I mean, I think I have something just to add to that, which is that when I was doing um, some research on what's happening with our kids, I think it was really striking to me how, how little we know here in the state. Um, but the one thing that we do know for sure is that they're in crisis. Um, whether you are looking at children between zero and nine years old, or you're looking at teenagers, we are seeing them uh, from a statewide level to you know, our regional level here in Chittenden County, that crisis is just going up. And um, I think a lot, you know, we're certainly seeing that in our schools. And you know, my, I, my child, two, my twins, both of them have you know, challenges. And I will say that they have had very difficult experiences in, um, our school system because they're just not equipped to respond and having police officers respond is not, is not appropriate um, because of their trauma or because of their behaviors. I, I think Jay had talked about this earlier that for very minor infractions, um, there's almost this over response that in of itself is traumatizing and also impacts their brain development <laughs> and therefore subsequent um, behaviors. Um, so this for me ties back to, you know, we need to start investing in our community systems, but a part of that really goes to the data collection. What we know about our kids is that, yes, they're in crisis, but also we don't know what's working for them. We don't even know what the demand is in terms of need um, so the, the depth of the data doesn't tell us the, a story. Um, so, you know, I think that that's one thing that I just, I want for people to understand that our kids really need more help and we need to actually start asking some questions about what's going on here uh, in Vermont with our, our children. And it ties right back to that investment question. Why aren't we investing in our, in our young kids? Yes. And, and Robin, your comments about data, they echo what Eitan was saying about the lack of adequate data in, in some areas. And there are a couple of uh, comments in the chat Absolutely. area too about we really, we really need to have the information that, to work with this. So um, Rilla asks, I wonder if training about implicit explicit bias on race, mental health, age, ability might also uh, engage the participants in the idea of how they hold themselves and others accountable. If they are involved in setting up the accountability systems along with citizens, perhaps the systems will be more effective. That's brilliant. Go ahead. That's really, really provocative. I like that. How do, person, we must exchange email. <laughs> um, we, we, oh, wow, I'm all jazz because I've like got a whole training like coming to mind right now. We need to talk. That's great. Okay, I'll stop now. Well, you can, you can tell us why it's great. But I, I, afterwards, I'll, uh, I'll give you and Rilla each other's emails. So Yes. <laughs> but yes. Do you want to expand on that? What's great about it? Because that's absolutely right. You and and I, I don't know why I haven't gone there yet. If you don't get buy-in from the people you're training, your efforts are dead. They are dead. It won't work. And I think a lot of training that is put forth does not work to do that. We can all be very critical of training. It's really easy. I'm really good at being a critic. I'm not as good at like building things. But um, one of the things that I have learned is how do you come at a student? If you come at a student and you expect the student to be a moron and a container into which you pour things, I mean, this is Paulo Freire, for those of you who know anything about pedagogy, and that you pour something into an empty container, that's not going to work. It's never worked. It really doesn't work when you're dealing with these issues. If you engage the person who you are training and say, I need your help. We need to get at this because your community needs this. Believe me, you get a completely different response. 
And I don't know why I haven't gone. Really, you said? I don't know why I haven't gone there, but that is really exciting and I need to go there. That's why. Okay. You know, I do, um, you know, I think the sentiment is a good one. At the same time, I'm very aware because I've been engaged in advocacy to in, in increase accountability systems and policing for the last five years. And every step of the way, it is a, it is a fight. It, and it's about power because no entity wants to be held accountable really. No entity wants to have, especially have other people who are not of the entity holding it accountable. And that is a real problem when it comes to policing because they already have a lot of power. Inherently, they carry guns. They have uniforms, they have the badge. They are the, they are the enforcers of law. Um, you cannot do anything to, um, to a police officer you cannot, and you cannot prevent them from doing anything. You can only deal with it after the fact. They can do anything they want in the moment. And that's a serious responsibility that they have. It's a serious power. Um, and, and, but the law has come together in such a way over the last 50 years uh, in terms of court cases and statutes and, um, and, and, and policies in a way that has only strengthened that power to be you know, a, a, a state unto themselves. Mm -hmm. And so what, when we think about accountability, um, yes, yeah, so police probably need to see at the table because they know their profession um, from the inside, but you know, we need to democratize the accountability. And that's what's, because that's what's not existing. Um, we, it needs to put the people, put communities over the law enforcement entity. Right now, it's the other way around. Can I share? Jay, I guess what I'm trying, what what you're saying is really great, but I think what Rilla was getting at in her comment was that's not a zero sum game, as you very wisely put it when we were talking about the scarcity model. That we can do both of those things, and that if we change the paradigm, and it's perhaps not immediately adversarial, but if we try something that is collaborative what are the possible outcomes? I don't hear people doing that very often. It's always adversarial. I'm intrigued by someone suggesting that it might not be. No, I, I think it's important. I think it's really important, uh, an important point. My, 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 you know, you know the, what I mean is that, you know, in practice, anytime a community attempts to, through any kind of process, gain greater power over um, you know, law enforcement accountability than, than what the law enforcement entity has, it, it, it is, law enforcement will not go along. They will not be a part of it. And that is, that is the problem. That, that to me is the problem. They will not relinquish their authority in holding in how they hold themselves accountable. It is, it is like the it's a line. It's a line in the sand for them, and and that's the problem, I think, because we we really do need to to democratize that accountability, and that's because that's, um, and and if they are opposed to that, then then it's there's really nothing that, uh, and, and nothing is going to change their minds. I'm not I'm not sure what will other than you know, the community coming together and saying, we're doing this. <laughs> um, so it's just, well, I, you know, it, it's a complex problem. Robin, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I think right now in Burlington is such a, is a fine example of this where, um, you know, for a long time, the police have been invited into these conversations and have fought it tooth and nail and then you started to see a radicalization within our community. Um, and, you know, that's what happens when people aren't heard or listened to <laughs> over time is they go to an extreme 
and quite honestly, in, in Burlington, it's worked. Like we're starting to see changes because people are, are demanding change and are doing the legwork in the community to get that change. And it's unfortunate that our police department cannot be a partner in that. Um, but I think people are tempted to say, well, it's because you're attacking the police. Well, that's not where it started. We've been having polite conversations about policing for years and years and years. There have been studies, there have been reports, there have been pleading from community members for years. And it just got to the point where said, the community said enough is enough. We're gonna push this through. And, and they have, done, have been able to make progress by working around the police, you know, frankly, but, but for years, this has been an issue here in Burlington. It just has really come ahead. And I, I think it does speak to what Jay is, is saying. And, and even now we can't have, uh, you know, there's some re research that's being done on the police department and it feels like there's just a circling of the wagons and Really, it's like, let's look at what police need. What does our community need? And let's let's get real about this. Um, that's a, it's a tough, it's tough to feel hopeful, to be honest, that you can collaborate in these moments. Okay, thank you. So we're gonna need to wrap up in a few minutes. I would like to um, just give each of the three panelists the opportunity if there are any points you would like to add. I mean, there. Um, appreciate your your comments and questions and um, and your ideas and insights. This has been this has been very helpful. Um, and I know that there are probably lots of things that you could continue talking about. Are there any things you'd like to highlight in the last couple of minutes we have? Any one of you who'd like to go first can go for it. I mean, I feel like I've learned a lot. <laughs> um, so I'm really appreciative of that and for everybody to, to, to be on and for the questions here. I, um, just for folks to know, if people are curious about the CAHOOTS model, you can go to our website at mentalhealthfirstbtv.org and there's a whole CAHOOTS page. You can listen to a four minute NPR <laughs> uh, uh, interview or, there's the actual presentation that CAHOOTS gave to us at our forum. So the, the director of consulting from CAHOOTS in Eugene, Oregon, gave a presentation. It, his segment's about 20 minutes long and he gets into pretty substantial detail about um, their de-escalation model and um, the impact that it's had you know, on the community and in their partnership. So I just wanna encourage people to, to look at that and to spread the word about it. Post it on your Facebook pages you know, follow us on Facebook and Instagram so you can help get the word out about this alternative and also change change the conversation to solutions and, and what we can do together versus us kind of being stuck in, in place. That is a, uh, thank you, Robin. And the website is very helpful. I appreciate the, some of the statistics you have there um, and from the program in Oregon where they, they point out that the vast majority of cases uh, where there's mental health assistance needed, they handle it very smoothly without needing to call the police. And occasionally they do need to call the police, but most of the time it's mental health professionals and, uh, and volunteers who can handle the situation. So That's right. You. Of the 16,000 calls that they responded to, they only needed to pull in police 300 and 15 times. Yeah. So I, I think that that speaks volumes in of itself. Uh, thank you, Robin. Jay? Hey, Tom. Yeah, um, a couple of things. You know, I, I want to say, like, first off, that uh, when I talk about police, or I think when, when people talk about policing, you know, it's really, it, it's rarely about I guess, you know, there's always a lot of focus on individual officers and, and the wrong do and wrongdoing or uses of force and things like that. You know, I still choose to believe that most people go into law enforcement with good intentions and that they, they just want to help their community. Like, I, I think that that's broadly true. 
the problem is systemic. It is a systems problem. It's a culture problem. And so, but if, but if we don't change the system, if we don't change the culture, you know, it doesn't matter if the person is, is good, bad, or indifferent because they're gonna do what the system requires them to do and what it tells them to do. And so, and, and so that's what needs to be addressed. You know, I think that, you know, and I, I'd like to give some good news, uh, good news, bad news, I guess. You know, good news is like Vermont, you know, we do better on a number of fronts than many other states in the nation. And I think that's something that we can be proud of. Um, you know, and we're currently leading the nation. We have the strongest, as of last, last legislative session, the strongest use of force bill in the country, um, you know, the, the strictest use of force language in the country, which is great. Um, we, had, we have banned the use of facial recognition in policing, which is great. You know, we've been doing a number of things and in response to the, the, uh, the killing of George Floyd and, and the protests of last summer. The bad news is that there's already movement to claw those things back. And I think it's, an, it's, a, it's imperative that people don't sit down and go home and think everything's taken care of because it's not. Uh, we need, we still need, there's still a lot of work to be done and there's still, there's defense work to be done now for the victories we have won. So I, I encourage you all to stay involved and to, and, to, and, and to get involved as much as you can on these issues at the local level and uh, at the state level. Okay, thank you, Jay. Eitan, any uh, closing comments? I'm not sure it's gonna be clear in the amount of time we have left, like which is 30, 60 seconds. Um, I think I would simply say, and I hope any, this is comprehensible, um, we need new models for discussion. We need radically new models for the discussion if this is ever going to move anywhere. And those models have got to stop being adversarial in their inherent nature. I think that was pretty clear. Yes. <laughs> Thank you very much. So a reminder to everyone that the information that uh, the panelists and, and uh, participants have been putting into the chat box will be compiled and that will be available on the Kellogg Hubbard Library website. And also this program has been recorded and the previous three programs were also good and they were recorded. So all of those are available on the Kellogg Hubbard Library website under adults, programs, past programs. Um, so again, I'd like to thank the League of Women Voters and the Kellogg Hubbard Library and Dr. Eitan Azreddin Longo, uh, Robin Friedner McGuire, and Jay Diaz, and all of you for participating tonight. Thank you, everyone, and have a good evening.